Among the Patriots' many sins is its inability to pick a genre. Historic epic, horror, adventure, comedy, of course it fails at every one of these options, and as this video shall demonstrate, even the most throwaway of the Patriots' comedic relief scenes are often riddled with poor writing and history so bad that you'd think it was portraying a fantasy world. A poorly thought out fantasy world at that. Today's scene in question comes around halfway into the film. Uh, Cornwallis' army is trapped down in South Carolina, waging an irregular war against Mel Gibson's militia, who are strangling the regulars of supplies through hit-and-run tactics. So because the British have to be all hoity-toity, they happen to be having a grand ball, a party of some sort, um, while they are uh, also unloading a much-needed supply ship nearby. And then of course, oh, big shocker, uh, an elite, ragged, you know, tiny team of Gibson super soldiers manages to sneak in and make a mess of the whole thing. It hits every single trope that you would imagine from a bad American action film, woman stupid, man angry, and big boom! What more does an audience need, right? Let's take it from the top, because you'll find that the um, deeper down we go into the scene, the worse that it gets. We learn from Cornwallis that this ball is being held at Middleton Place. Colonel Tavington, why after six weeks am I still here in Middleton Place attending a ball in South Carolina when I should be attending balls in North Carolina? A real plantation just outside of Charleston which still exists today, although the original building has uh, unfortunately since been destroyed by fire. Uh, which leads to one of those incredibly rare moments that the Patriot actually does something pretty well. This is where the original estate stood. Now, I don't know if it was done with computer graphics or with a physical model, but one way or another, the creators of the film actually managed to recreate this historic environment for the movie. That's a really cool detail. Although, as, as usual, unfortunately, the real Revolutionary War history of Middleton Place is way more interesting than what we actually get in The Patriots, uh, because rather than hosting some fancy ball for the British Army and local loyalists, Arthur Middleton, the property's owner, was actually a delegate at the Continental Congress. He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, I don't think he's going to be throwing any parties for Cornwallis anytime soon. Uh, and apparently it ran in the family as well, because his father, Henry Middleton, was actually the second president of the Congress. And that's why, when Cornwallis' army came into town in 1780, they didn't have a nice little party with the locals. They looted the estate. They imprisoned Arthur and hauled him down to Florida for, like, the most, if not the entire war, which is you know, pretty grim back in the day. Not only is the real history, again, just like more interesting, but it also provides a great opportunity to show the British being baddies. But instead, the real bad stuff that they did, you know, looting this estate and everything because a guy signed a document, that's ignored in favor of fabricated atrocity elsewhere. It's like, if you want to have some great clips of the British breaking down doors and smashing paintings and burning down buildings, they're like, hello? Like, they looted the place. Looting is not a gentle process. The horror, our supply ship appears to have arrived. Uh, yes, 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 my lord, it has, yes. Then why am I still wearing this rag? My lord, your replacement wardrobe is aboard ship, but uh, Colonel Tavington thought it best to secure our arms and munitions first. They are being unloaded now. In any case, this is where the British have decided to unload all of their supplies, to which I immediately have to ask, why? Middleton Place is less than 20 miles outside of the port city of Charleston, which would have fixed infrastructure like cranes and whatnot to do all the heavy lifting of those supplies. Right now, these ships are just moored in some random river in the middle of nowhere. It would make the unloading process so much more difficult than it really has to be. Uh, presumably, they uh, just have a couple of boats that are rowing everything back and forth constantly as if they were re resupplying on some like deserted, you know, Caribbean island somewhere. But like the infrastructure is there, they could have this done really, really quick instead of piecemeal, given that the supplies are apparently so important. Uh, I mean, okay, sure, you know, maybe uh, the portion of the army that needs those supplies, they're not in Charleston right now. but. Even then, they're only a few hours away by wagon. They're, again, less than 20 miles. That's a pretty easy trip to make, considering that you're going to have to be transporting these supplies over wagon anyways. Uh, again, you know, considering that it's munitions and powder and whatnot. Uh, and before you say it, there is no logical reason uh, why we should believe that the British wouldn't be able to protect those supply lines 
within 20 miles of their own headquarters, of like their own borders. It, not in real life, this isn't the Russian army. Although it may be worth pointing out that while this scene is easily one of the worst when it comes to portraying Cornwallis, because seriously, he was not the kind of guy to whine about his uniform not being pretty enough when there are vital military supplies that have to be taken care of first. Uh, it does happen to be one of the few times that Tavington slash Tarleton manages to do something right in that he orders the arms and munitions to be given preference to the non-essentials that those, you know, prissy little nobles like Cornwallis want to have unloaded first. It's, it's horrible, but at least he does something right there. Um, we'll talk about the Patriots just massacre of the very British personalities in a later video though. But what that line tells us is that this process is actively taking place at night when it's harder to see in the middle of a random field with zero infrastructure to aid that process. Uh, and of course, they're unloading a bunch of powder while simultaneously having a fancy ball like less than a thousand feet away. Remember that, it's going to be important later. And while we're on the topic, let's talk about the Ashley River. We know that it's the Ashley River because we know that this is Middleton Place. And a quick little search online, it took me about five seconds, will tell us that the Ashley River has a depth of roughly six to eight feet on average. Let's take a look at those ships now. They're pretty large. At least the one is a fully rigged ship with three masts. And conveniently, ages ago, someone sent me a blog post that discusses the various ship models that were used in the Patriot, where we can see a very clean image of this same ship. Uh, we can see that it has a gun deck with at least, looks like 10 or 11 ports on either side. Now, whatever its precise classification, you know, whether it's now used solely as a supply ship or whether it's still a warship, you know, whatever, uh, it is, all of its dimensions make it roughly equivalent, I think, to a sixth-rate ship. And uh, just how low does a sixth-rate sit in the water? Well, HMS Rose, a 20-gun ship that saw service in the American War, had a draft of 9 feet and 7 inches. There's also a full replica of the Rose, now called HMS Surprise, the one that is used in Master and Commander, and uh, she sits 13 feet deep. Another historic example, HMS Ariadne, launched 1816, was another ship of roughly equivalent size. Uh, she was 10 feet 3 inches deep, and so on, so forth. I think you get the idea. We shouldn't so much be asking, why is the ship unloading here when it could be literally anywhere else with a dock? So much as we should be asking, how is a ship of this size even there to begin with? Vessels of this size wouldn't be able to make it up a river that goes as shallow as six feet, let alone if they were laden with cargo. And you know what isn't too large and unwieldy to slip silently up a river through hostile territory to offload vital supplies for the army? Well, that's right, it's the video's sponsor, Exter. Blast it! Sir, we can't go any further. We'll run aground! Damn your eyes, man! There's no other course open to us! We must carry on! There is another way, sir. Our extra wallets, sir. What? You've gone mad, Mr. Fisher. Sir, extra wallets are incredibly slim and minimal in their design. Their sleek profile leaves them less than half the size of a conventional bifold, and each of them can carry up to 12 cards plus cash in secure fashion. You're not saying precisely, sir. Call up the hands. We'll have them lash all of their extra wallets together and form a pontoon large enough to float all of our supplies down the river. Each extra wallet is light enough to make it work while still being made of high quality and environmentally friendly materials like Italian leather and carbon fiber. Why wouldn't we just use our jolly boats to row the materials down? Well, because this is an ad, sir, please, you gotta stick to the script, okay? No, oh, yes, right, right, uh, Well, what if something should happen? What if we lose some of the men's wallets along the way? Or worse, what if they encounter some banditry? Well, that's easy enough, sir. Extra wallets come with an RFID protection against wireless theft, and we can easily track their location from our smartphones, whatever that is, with their solar-powered tracking devices. I've already seen to it that they're fully charged. Only two hours in the sun is enough for three months of tracking, sir. And once the men reach their destination, they'll be able to offload the cargo quickly and quietly, far more so than if they were using a jolly boat with the wall's quick card access. I mean, it's also, like, incredibly satisfying. I mean, look at this. 
Oh, that is satisfying. I know, right? I've been doing this all day. Anyways, look, sir, I know it's risky, but we are at war. We need to make this happen. Exter has not let me down yet in style or in practicality. It's been easy to use and is clearly very well made. I think this could work, sir. Well, all right then, we'll give it a shot. Mr. Fisher, call all hands and begin to create the Exter Pontoon. We'll need a lot of wallets to make this happen. Thank goodness we were able to get up to 40% off our orders during the New Year sale. Indeed, sir. A simple matter of using the discount code BRANDONF, or of course visiting the link in the description down below. Why, when they receive those supplies, the army sure will say thank you to Exter for sponsoring this video, and now, back to the business of the day. The fact that this scene is literally impossible is hardly the most ridiculous thing about it. I mean, were it not for what happens to these magically teleported ships after the fact, I wouldn't have ever even thought to look so deeply into the scene to begin with. We started at the top. Now let's work our way down to the real insanity. So what's the master plan, the 007 action? Eight men, stolen uniforms, they sneak on board and blow the ship sky high. The first question we have to ask here is, how did these guys even manage to steal the boat? And how are they approaching the ship so easily? This is happening right under Cornwallis's nose. The army is presumably encamped all around the plantation. How did they even manage to get close enough to Middleton Place, let alone manage to overpower the boat's crew without raising any sort of alarm? And is there only one boat unloading the ship of all of its supplies? I mean, there's a good heckin' reason to unload at a place with proper infrastructure right there. Unloading a ship like this, the whole area ought to be buzzing with activity. Not only the ship, which we see is just dead quiet rather than all the hands working to, you know, haul up supplies and whatnot, but also at wherever the uh, supplies are being offloaded. There should be boats moving back and forth. There should be teams of people there to move the supplies from, like, the shore over to the army. Th th there should be a lot of activity. This is a busy thing to do, unloading a ship, especially if you're unloading it of black powder, and especially if that powder is so important! Oh, and then of course, on top of all that, uh, you, because you know, you know how the Navy works, there's gonna be Marines, not only on the ship and on the boat probably, there's gonna be Marines on the shore where the boats are being offloaded to make sure that the seamen are doing their job and that no one's gonna hightail it. All those guys then managed to get overpowered completely silently by these eight, you know, rebels uh, without anyone so much as firing a shot, without even anyone so much as shouting within, you know, like, hearing distance of probably the entire flipping army? Oh yeah, and it gets worse. So, okay, somehow, against all odds, Gibson manages to get the boat. They manage to get the uniforms, and they're now rowing over to their target. Now, normally, this kind of thing happens during the day, like the offloading process, which would, uh, you know, allow the officer on the watch to pretty easily identify who was coming over visually. But even still, identification is important, so even with something as routine as offloading a ship, when there is a boat coming at you, you probably issue a challenge to them as part of the course. And especially you're gonna do that at nighttime uh, when you can't see the boat except for its little lantern. It's a pretty important job for, again, probably an officer on the watch or at least someone on board the ship. You issue a challenge, you hear them back, like, okay, yeah, they know the passcode, they know the password, whatever. They're one of ours. We can let them on board. So they issue a challenge to the upcoming boat. Does Gibson somehow know the reply? How did he get the reply? Did they manage to somehow steal the ship's logs for that day? Did they manage to not only capture the boat without anybody noticing, but also silently interrogate one of the crew to get the word? Well, Either way, let's presume that one of them somehow knows what the reply would be, and so they, they shout it back, and they're able to row up really nice and close. Now comes time for them to lay alongside and climb aboard. But not before a question must assuredly pop into the mind of even the least competent Royal Navy officer. He's gonna look, all, look on over the side as the guys are coming up, and they're like, huh. Why is this boat being crewed entirely by a bunch of army soldiers? Uh, now normally in an operation like this, it's, it's the Navy's job to offload these supplies. Uh, I mean, okay, sure, you know, maybe the army is lending some hands to help, but still, it, it'd be up to the seamen to row that boat under the direction of a Navy officer, not a bunch of landsmen. They probably don't even know how to row the boat properly. That's you know, a pretty large boat and everything. You need 
you know, guys who know what they're doing, and you need a, an officer to watch over those men. You know, yeah, maybe there are some Marines who are doing the rowing, sure, but none of those guys are Marines, not with those blue facings. They aren't the Royal Marines yet. They don't get that title until 1802, and only Royal regiments get to wear blue facings like that. The, the Marines have white facings on their red coats. Those guys, they're not Marines. Did something go wrong ashore? Well, why did the army take control of this boat? Might this be cause to... I don't know, maybe get the captain while the men are being brought alongside and coming aboard. Uh, I don't know, maybe alert one of the officers of the Marines, like, hey, is something fishy going on? You may want to investigate, because that's kind of your job to do that. Um, oh, yeah. and don't say that the, uh, that the A-team here managed to somehow sneak through an open gun port either. A sixth-rate ship like this, when fully crewed, could have almost 200 men and officers aboard, plus a detachment of Marines. There is no chance that they managed to completely catch the ship unawares in this situation, again, when they were announcing their presence with the lantern and people knew that they were there! Anyways, somehow, somehow, they managed to, let's say, make it on board, again, without raising any kind of alarm. People just assume, like, oh, I guess the army's doing our job for us now. Hey, that's pretty cool, eh, Jenkins? Yeah, it is, all right. They move on, sure, whatever. No shots ringing out, no alarm, no shouting, no questioning, nothing. So now, all they need to do is evade all the guys who are actively working on this ship at any number of duties, including the active hauling up and loading of supplies into, incidentally, the same boat that they just came out of, and start setting up for the explosion before finally sneaking back onto their boat and then getting away to safety. And incidentally, blowing up a ship that is full of gunpowder means that you can't just get into the water and you're safe. You gotta get a pretty heckin' long distance away, which means a significant time on whatever fuse you happen to be setting, which also means more time if you do manage to somehow set the fuse and get away. It's more time for any one of those men who are loading the powder to notice like, oh hey, there's a fuse on that barrel. Hey guys, something funny just happened. Who was trying to blow up the ship? Maybe? A little bit? I don't know. The only other alternative is that we are meant to believe that these eight men managed to kill or incapacitate every single person on that ship without raising any sort of alarm, including aboard the second ship that is right behind them, again within speaking distance on that dark and quiet night. Unless... Unless this rabbit hole, it, go, oh, it goes deeper than we could have ever imagined. There is a conspiracy at work here, people. Grab your tinfoil cocked hats, because it's time to get scared, patriots. There were multiple control blasts on that ship, I swear. Don't believe me? Just want to buy the big Hollywood narrative just because mischievous Mel told you to? Well, it's time for you to do your own research, patriots. By which I mean, you listen to me, an erratic YouTube rant. Uh, uh, Okay, I can't do the voice the whole time, it's gonna murder my throat. Anyways, zoom in on that ship, enhance that image. Now play it back in slow motion. There, yeah, you, you see the first blast on the top deck, right at the base of the main mast. It's simple, right? They want you to believe that that is what destroyed the ship. Look at how the explosion travels, how it moves down below decks and then blasts out of a single gun port towards what, the stern? Well, that's weird. Why one port? Why blasting out of one, but none of the others along the way? Keep on watching. That first explosion up top starts to fizzle away when suddenly, boom, a second explosion. This time it's more towards the stern. Looks like it was maybe coming from the quarter deck. Oh, 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 but that is the least of it, my friends. Further down, look to the Orlop deck, blasting out of a smaller porthole there. That explosion didn't manage to somehow work its way between two decks, completely ignoring various exit points along the way before finally leaping out of the bottom. It just doesn't physically make any sense, patriots. We are looking at a third demolition. And then there is already a point of delay before yet another blast tears out of the stern. What? Did the explosion finally find its way to the magazine traveling all over throughout the ship? Or was this yet another explosion to destroy a now structurally weakened ship from the, from the initial controlled blast? Uh, black powder cannot destroy uh, wooden ships. Anyways, 
If that, is, if that isn't enough to convince you, then keep on watching as another totally separate explosion can be seen from the total opposite end of the vessel, back on the top of the ship, right next to where the original blast took place. Why didn't the first explosion set off that charge? Anyways, they didn't even try to hide the final explosion, which is totally separate from the last one. First, a blast comes up from the top, and then another one entirely below blows out the side and finishes the ship off. And we know that it's a separate blast because look at how it blows the whole side of the ship off in one chunk like that, rather than traveling down. If that explosion was traveling down from the main deck, like Lion Mel wants us to believe, well, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see how it wouldn't look like that. And all of that, all that, and the ship doesn't even jiggle. It doesn't even move an inch after all those massive supposed explosions wreck the whole thing. I'm gonna be honest, patriots. I'm scared. I'm scared because not only have the globalist British Empire frog people managed to get away with something so blatant, I mean, it's obviously a false flag attack here, but nobody even wants to be asking these questions. Not the papers, not Parliament, nobody. Patriots, the storm is coming. If you want to protect your family, um, I don't know, join my Patreon or something. That'll, that'll probably help. Anyways, anyways, um, I know that this is a small scene and that um, it's just meant to provide a little bit of comedic relief. I get that. And obviously I am reading way too much into everything here because that's part of the fun. Obviously, you know, counting the individual prop explosions to get the thing to actually go. Th that's ridiculous. It's not like it was a narrative choice for them to have multiple explosions. They just thought that it looked best like that. Um, and I guess it, it does look very fiery and big explosion. It's fun, I guess. But at the end of the day, the fact that this scene it's, it's the fact that it's meant to be comedic relief, that doesn't exonerate. I know that I'm taking it too far, but like, it doesn't exonerate it or make it any better. If anything, I would actually say that it makes the core logic of the scene worse, in a way. The Patriot isn't fantasy as much as people want it to be. It's portraying real people, using real names, in real places, during real historic events. But it's blending those real historical events with fabricated events in a way that never attempts to show the viewer where that line is drawn. The film doesn't exist in a vacuum, and as much as we may want to say, oh, well, it's only a movie. It's, no one thinks it's real, obviously. No one expects it to be historically accurate. The film, that's not true. That's not how it works. It actively informs many people's views of not only the American War of Independence, but the American Revolution, the, the founding of the American nation, the nature of military conflict and civil society itself. It informs all of these things. And if you don't believe that, well, it sounds to me like you've not had enough conversations with the American public where you have to explain that no, the British weren't stubbornly refusing to take cover in between burning churches full of civilians. And indeed, the warfare can be not so black and white as all that a lot of times. And perhaps the epitome of this scene's ridiculousness, narratively and otherwise, comes in the form of this lady here. Oh yes, I know that you've been waiting for me to talk about her. Oh. Oh, my words, love, yeah. <laughs> so there's a few possibilities here. One, the woman is mentally ill. She could be a sadist, or she could be a, a secret pyromaniac rebel sympathizer, um, or perhaps she severely needs glasses and has lost most of her hearing, so she is sort of uh, deaf and dumb to what is going on around her. Although I think that the most likely explanation may just be that she's stupid, because ha-ha, British woman's stupid. Now this isn't just a fire that some the one could reasonably expect to be part of a fireworks show. This isn't just like all the fireworks even going off all at once. This is a massive explosion, like a truly massive explosion of a ship that is filled with gunpowder. Laugh as she might now, even though it doesn't make any sense for her to be laughing because it's like, again, unless she is just completely oblivious to everything, like unreasonably so, it's very obvious that that's not part of the show, but all right, sure. Laugh as she might now, in just a second or two, given how close that ship was, um, you know, to the party and everything, there's going to be debris falling all over that pretty lawn and severely injuring, possibly even killing people. 
We'll see if everyone at the party is so calm. It's sort of like, oh my, that's so, that's so disturbing and everything. Uh, we'll see if they're so calm when chunks of splintered wood and metal, to say nothing of possible severed limbs and other body parts, are beginning to rain down on them to accompany the screams of mutilated men being burned alive on the ship or drowning and all other sorts of horrible, horrible messes. A vessel exploding like that is not a laughing matter. Not just to the people that were there on the ground, but to us as the audience. This sort of thing shouldn't be funny. Such destructive force should be terrible. It should be frightening to the audience. It should be awe-inspiring in the most literal sense of the word. Could you imagine if any other war film tried to add this kind of comedic relief to a moment like this? Oh, fireworks, lovely. <laughs> it wouldn't be funny so much as it would be laughable, like, like laughably tone deaf. It would just be plain gross. It's one thing to have individuals within the context of a film find terrible things entertaining, as evidently this woman does, whatever her problem is. But it's quite another, I think, for the creators to actively encourage the audience to participate in it. And this scene is absolutely meant to be comedic relief for the audience. It's not just that woman having a good time because she's a moron. Rather, she's a moron and everyone's, you know, giving their reactions so that we find it entertaining. Tevington going, oh God, while men are burning alive just a few feet away from him. Maybe not the most natural reaction. Maybe, I don't know, fear, maybe anger. Yes, frustration, but also leaping into action to get something done. Like, this is a big deal. I think that when a film encourages its audience to participate in atrocity, in, in bad things, that's when a line is crossed. I don't like it when death is used as comedic relief in what is otherwise a serious piece. This film goes back and forth between a, a church burning with civilians, like civilians burning alive in a locked up building, screaming and crying and pleading for mercy and praying and everything. And then in that same film, we have this, basically the same thing. Men, you know, again, presumably burning alive in this wrecked hull of a ship that they can't escape from, but it's meant to be funny. Do you, do you see the disconnect between those things? If this entire film was comedy, sure, you know, entire film being comedy, that's one thing, that's fine. It's like Hogan's Hero or, or whatever. It's all a comedy and it's meant to poke fun in order, if anything, to draw attention to a terrible thing. That's different. That's one thing. But like I said before, the Patriot really just can't seem to decide what genre it wants to be other than just getting the audience to chant USA at every possible turn. But, you know what? I believe that we have had enough of my ravings and rantings for the day. I think that you get my point by now. And that even when it's just a little throwaway scene, on closer examination, the Patriot just really cannot seem to be bothered to make any level of sense or to provide any level of cohesive narrative alongside some rather disturbing mental trends along the way as far as the minds of the people who wrote the thing and the people who seem to enjoy it so much. Shocking, I know. Let me know what video you'd like to see in this series next, because I'm thinking that the Battle of Camden needs to be discussed sooner rather than later. And until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain... Oh, hold on. Well, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient... I'm sorry, I'm kind of going more southern there, aren't I? Anyways, your most humble and obedient of servants. Thank you all so very much for watching, and most particularly to those of you who support my work on Patreon, because without your generosity, videos like this and this silly thing would not be possible. And if you are looking for an amazing way to support this channel without spending any of your own money, I publish all, publish all of my videos early on Recast.tv. It takes only a few seconds to sign up there and subscribe to me, and they pay me a heck of a lot better than YouTube does. Like, like, more than 10 times better. Um, so give me a follow there and you'll be the first to know when my next video is out. And also my first uh, recast exclusive video shall be coming out fairly soon as well. So sign up and I will see you there as well.